The music plays on, a history of the great American jukebox. You know, being a kid of the ni late 1960s was really more than a little awesome. A favorite memory of mine is that of the jukebox, those wonderful music playing machines that were incredibly popular and were everywhere in the late 1960s. There were a couple of bars in Bridgeport, Michigan that my dad, Frank Morrison, frequented. Oftentimes, I went with him, and sometimes we'd even shoot a game of pool. I loved doing that with my dad. I always begged um, <clears throat> change from him uh, for the jukebox. The selection I always went to was J12, Aquarius, Let the Sun Shine In by the Fifth Dimension. Loved that song. Still do. Jukeboxes had been popular for a long, long time, and they <clears throat> have been, uh, and they have uh, a very interesting history that goes back to that incredible uh, genius of inventor Thomas Alva Edison. Bet you didn't know that. I didn't really either, but it stands to reason, I guess. Mr. Edison changed the world of entertainment back in 1877, which was when he came up with the phonograph. <clears throat> He was adverse to his brainchild being used for entertainment, but there was no stopping the inevitable. He was actually trying to come up with a working telephone answering machine, and when that didn't pan out, he wanted his creation to be used as a dictation machine. And it did see such usage, but that was overshadowed, of course, by its use as a music reproducing machine. In 1889, <clears throat> November 23rd to be exact, uh, a man with a vision, Lewis Glass, bought one of Edison's machines and then made the addition to it of a coin slot. Mr. Glass set his machine up inside the uh, Palace Royale Saloon in San Francisco, and that early device had very little in common with machines to come, but it was a start, and a humble start, but a start. The machine at the Palace uh, <clears throat> Royale caused quite a stir, as very few people had had the chance to see or hear the marvelous talking machine. I actually played a uh, wax cylinder, or I didn't, excuse me, I'm sorry. It actually played a wax cylinder and had no electronic amplifiers, only four tubes uh, to listen with, and it could only play one record over and over. But it was enough of a novelty that people were willing to lay down a nickel to hear it. Uh, that might not sound like much, but in, in 1889, a nickel was worth significantly more than today. The machine brought in $15 a week, and encouraged uh, by this, Mr. Glass set up 12 more around San Francisco, and they all pulled a pretty good weekly profit. As word of Glass's use of the machine uh, became more public, many saloons across the country followed his lead, and a new uh, <clears throat> market was given birth. It was about 17 years later that the first true jukebox hit the streets. Um, its name was the Automatic Entertainer which was a bit misleading since it had to be cranked by hand to operate, so it really wasn't automatic. A big difference is that this machine played 10-inch discs rather than wax cylinders. The tubes for listening gave way to a 40-inch horn speaker, but without electric amplification, you still had to be fairly close to hear it. Oh, and uh, one other thing, it played more than one selection. A change, uh, a change that fascinated users was the recording or the record changing mechanism. It was actually mounted inside a glass cabinet on the top of the machine so customers could observe its works. A lot of people thought that alone was worth their nickel and they would stand and stare at the mechanical uh, action so, uh, so they were as much fun to watch as they were to hear back in the day. So devices like the automatic entertainer had the market all to themselves despite the problem with volume for the next 20 years. Then, in 1927, the problem with the volume was resolved as the automatic music instrument in, uh, introduced the very first electronically amplified music playing machine. All of a sudden, the jukebox was able to compete with loud orchestras, and still for only a nickel. But uh, now, for that same nickel, all the people in a saloon or a large hall could be entertained. About the same time, radio was becoming very popular and was a threat to the jukebox, jukebox industry. As alcohol was illegal at the time, and rather than quit drinking, people in the millions began hitting illegal speake, uh, speakeasies, and of course, they wanted to be entertained. The jukebox was the perfect solution as they were cheaper and much less risky than bringing in a big band. The story of how the uh, name jukebox came along is interesting in its own right. The automatic record machine became very, very popular 
in uh, black speakeasies in particular, which were known as juke joints, which was then a slang term for houses of prostitution, and eventually juke came to mean dance. Part of the reason for machine, the machine's popularity in juke joints was because there was virtually nowhere that black musicians could play their records, which consisted of jazz, rhythm, and blues, um, which were considered black music and had a limited market back then. Because they were closely associated with juke joints, the record-playing machines became known as, you guessed it, the jukebox. To say the jukebox was popular back then is definitely an understatement. In 1939, over 30 million records were used in jukeboxes. Only three years later, in 1942, that was up to 60 million. That was a total of half the records totally produced <clears throat> for that year. The competition from radio and home phonographs became fierce, and in 1937, jukeboxes looked pretty much like a wooden box, but they changed in appearance considerably in the 1940s, making them more than a, a mere source of music. They became showpieces of light and color in spectacular designs. Some of the styles, uh, uh, man, some of the style man, styles manufactured, um, experimented with. Uh, including glass, chrome, very ornate metals, bubbling lights, mirrors, and so much more. Many were created with an art deco design that would boldly stand out wherever they were. And perhaps the most famous design was the Wurlitzer 1015. Debuting in 1946, the company sold nearly 60,000 of them. But all good things come to an end. Well, with the jukebox, it was never ended, but they slowed down. Post-World War II sales um, were still huge, around 700,000, of, of them in the United States. Most of these played about 20 records, not counting those that could play the B-sides. The 1970s saw the era of the jukebox begin to decline due to FM radio, cassette tapes, 8-track tapes, higher cost of records, and even uh, drunk driving laws uh, because uh, bars closed earlier because of the drunk driving laws and thus not, uh, not as much use of the jukebox as had been. But by 1992, there were only around 180 ju jukeboxes in America, and current technology has hastened their decline. The jukebox was most assuredly an American long-lived fad, and for those of us who experienced a part of their heyday, they will always be an iconic symbol of the American music scene. Well, thanks for listening and stopping by. I appreciate it. Please share your comments in the section below. Be sure to subscribe <clears throat> and give us a thumbs up. God bless and have a great day. Bye.